Chapter Seven of Travel Stories Retold from Saint Nicholas by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven: Motoring Through the Golden Age, Part One, by Albert Bigelow Payne. It was some time in June when we found ourselves drifting about Normandy in our motor car, and one peaceful evening we came to Bayeux and stopped there for the night. Bayeux, which is about sixty miles from Cherbourg, was intimately associated with the life of William the Conqueror, and is today the home of the famous Bayeux Tapestry, a piece of linen two hundred and thirty feet long and eighteen inches wide, on which is embroidered in coloured wool the story of William's conquest of England. William's queen, Matilda, is supposed to have designed this marvellous pictorial document, and even executed it, though probably with the assistance of her ladies. Completed in the eleventh century, it would seem to have been stored in the Bayeux Cathedral, where it lay, scarcely remembered, for a period of more than six hundred years. Then, attention was called to its artistic and historic value, and it became still more widely known when Napoleon brought it to Paris and exhibited it at the Louvre. Now it is back in Bayeux and has a special room in the museum there, and a special glass case so arranged so that you can walk around it and see each of its fifty-eight tableaux. Matilda was ahead of her time in art. She was a futurist, anybody could see that who had been to one of the recent exhibitions but she was exactly abreast in the matter of history it is likely that she embroidered the events as they were reported to her and her records are beyond price to-day i suppose she sat in a beautiful room with her maids about her all engaged at the great work and i hope she looked as handsome as she does in the fine painting that hangs above the case containing her masterpiece it was the closing hour when we got to the Bayer Museum, but the guardian generously gave us plenty of time to walk around and look at all the marvelous procession of horses and men whose outlines have remained firm and whose colors have stayed fresh for more than eight hundred years. There is something fine and stirring about Matilda's tapestry. No matter if Harold does seem to be having an attack of pleurisy when he is only putting on his armor, or if the horses appear to have detachable legs. I could see that the Joy, who is a judge of horses, did not think much of Queen Matilda's drawing, and their riders were not much better. Still, it was wonderful how they did seem to go in some of the battles, and they made that old story seem very real to us. Tradition has it that the untimely death of Matilda left the tapestry unfinished, for which reason William's coronation does not appear. Next day at Caen we visited Matilda's tomb in a church which she herself founded. Her remains have never been disturbed. We also visited the tomb of the Conqueror on the other side of the city at the church of St. Etienne, but the Conqueror's bones are not there now. They were scattered by the Huguenots in 1562 we enjoy can we wandered about among its ancient churches and still more ancient streets at one church a wedding was going on and narcissa and i lingered a little to assist one does not get invited to a normandy wedding every day especially in the old town where william i organized his followers to invade england no doubt this bride and groom were descendants of some of william's wild normans but they looked very mild and handsome and modern to us Caen became an important city under William the Conqueror. Edward III of England captured and pillaged it about the middle of the 14th century, at which time it was larger than any city in England except London. Today, Caen has less than 50,000 inhabitants and is mainly interesting for its art treasures and its memories. Our travel program included Rouen, Amiens, and Beauvais, cathedral cities lying more to the northward it was at rouen that we started to trace backward the sacred footsteps of joan of arc saint and saviour of france for it is at rouen that the pathway ends when we had visited the great cathedral whose fairy-like facade is one of the most beautiful in the world we drove to a corner of the old market-place and stopped before a bronze tablet which tells that on this spot on a certain day in may fourteen thirty one it was the twenty ninth a young girl who had saved her country from an invading and conquering enemy was burned at the stake 
that was five hundred years ago but time has not dulled the tragedy of the event its memory of suffering its humiliation all those centuries since the nation that joan saved has been trying to atone for her death streets have been named for her and statues have been set up for her in public squares all over france there is little in rouen today that joan saw the cathedral was there in her time but she was never permitted to enter it there is a wall which was a part of the chapel where she had her final hearing before her judges there are some houses which she must have passed and there is a tower which belonged to the castle in which she was imprisoned though it is not certain that it is joan's tower there is a small museum in it and among its treasures we saw the manuscript article st joan of arc by mark twain who in the personal recollections has left to the world the loveliest picture of that lovely life it was our purpose to leave rouen by the amiens road but when we got to it and looked up a hill that about halfway to the zenith arrived at the sky we decided to take a road that led off toward beauvais we could have climbed that hill well enough and i wish later we had done so as it was we ran along pleasantly during the afternoon and attended evening services at an old church at grand vivier a place that we had never heard of before but where we found an inn as good as any in normandy it is curious with what exactness fate times its conclusions if we had left grand Villiers a few seconds earlier or later it would have made all the difference or if i had not pulled up a moment to look at a lovely bit of brookside planted with poplars or if i had driven the least bit slower or the least bit faster during the first five miles or oh never mind what happened was this we had just mounted a long steep hill at high speed and i had been bragging of the car always a dangerous thing to do when i saw ahead of us a big two-wheeled cart going in the same direction as ourselves and beyond it a large car approaching i could have speeded up and cut in ahead of the cart but i was feeling well and i thought i should do the courteous thing the safe thing so i fell in behind it not far enough behind however for as the big car came opposite the sleepy driver of the cart awoke pulled up his horse short and we were not far enough behind for me to get the brakes down hard and suddenly enough to stop before we touched him it was not a smash it was just a push but it pushed a big hole in our radiator smashed up one of our lamps and crinkled up our left mudguard the radiator was the worst the water poured out our car looked as if it had burst into tears we were really stupefied at the extent of our disaster the big car at once pulled up to investigate and console us the occupants were americans too from washington kindly people who wanted to shoulder some of the blame their chauffeur a frenchman bargained with the cart driver who had wrecked us to tow us to the next town where there were garages certainly pride goes before a fall five minutes earlier we were sailing along in glory exulting over the prowess of our vehicle now all in the wink of an eye our precious conveyance stricken and helpless was being towed to the hospital its owners trudging mournfully behind the village was poix and if one had to be wrecked anywhere i cannot think of a lovelier spot for disaster than poix de la Zone it is just across in picardy and the river somme is a little brook that ripples and winds through poplar shaded pastures sweet meadows and deep groves in every direction are the loveliest walks with landscape pictures at every turn the village itself is drowsy kindly simple-hearted the landlady at our inn was a large motherly soul that during the week of our stay the joy learned to love and i to be grateful to for the others did not linger paris was not far away and had a good deal to recommend it the new radiator ordered from london might be delayed so early next morning they were off for paris by way of amiens and beauvais and the joy and i settled down to such employments and amusements as we could find while waiting for repairs we got acquainted with the garage man's family for one thing they lived in the same little court with the shop and we exchanged swiss french for their picardies and we were bosom friends in no time 
we spruced up the car too and every day took long walks and every afternoon took some luncheon and our spirit stove and followed down the somme to a little bridge and there made our tea then sometimes we read and once when i was reading aloud from joan of arc and had finished the great battle of Pate, we suddenly remembered that it had happened on the very day on which we were reading the eighteenth of june how little we guessed that in such a short time our peaceful little river would give its name to a battle a thousand times greater than any that joan ever fought one day i hired a bicycle for the joy and entertained the village by pushing her around the public square until she learned to ride alone then i hired one for myself and we went out on the road together about the end of the third day we began to look for our radiator and visited the express office with considerable regularity presently the village knew us why we were there and what we were expecting they became as anxious about it as ourselves one morning as we started toward the express office a man in a wagon passed and called out something we did not catch it but presently another met us and with a glad look told us that our goods had arrived and were now in the delivery wagon on the way to the garage we did not recognize either of those good souls but they were interested in our welfare our box was at the garage when we arrived there it was soon opened and the new radiator in place the other repairs had been made and once more we were complete we decided to start next morning to join the others in paris morning comes early on the longest days of the year and we had eaten our breakfast had our belongings put into the car and were ready to be off by seven o'clock what a delicious morning it was calm glistening the dew on everything as long as i live i shall remember that golden morning when the joy aged eleven and i went gypsying together following the winding roads and byways that led us through pleasant woods under sparkling banks and along the poplar planted streams of picardy we did not keep to highways at all we were in no hurry and we took any lane that seemed to lead in the right direction so that much of the time we appeared to be crossing fields fields of flowers many of them scarlet poppies often mingled with blue cornflowers and yellow mustard fancy the vividness of that color traveling in that wandering fashion it was noon before we got down to beauvais where we stopped for lunch and supplies and to see what is perhaps the most remarkable cathedral in the world it is one of the most beautiful and though it consists only of choir and transepts it is one of the largest its inner height from floor to vaulting is a hundred and fifty eight feet the average ten-story skyscraper could be set inside of it there was once a steeple that towered to the giddy height of five hundred feet but in fifteen seventy three when it had been standing three hundred years it fell down from having insufficient support the inner work is of white stone marble and the whole place seems filled with light Beauvais has many interesting things, but the day had become very warm, and we did not linger. We found some of the most satisfactory pastries I have ever seen in France, fresh and dripping with richness, also a few other delicacies, and by and by, under a cool apple tree on the road to Campien, the Joy and I spread out our feast and ate it, and listened to some little French birds singing, Vita, 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 meaning that we must be quick, quick, quick so they could have the crumbs it was at compiegne that joan of arc was captured by her enemies just a year before that last fearful day at rouen she had relieved orleans she had fought pate she had crowned the king at Reims. she would have had her army safely in paris if she had not been withheld by a weak king influenced by his shuffling time-serving counsellors she had delivered compiegne the year before but now again it was in trouble besieged by the duke of burgundy i will go to my good friends of compiegne she said when the news came and taking such force as she could muster in number about six hundred cavalry she went to their relief from a green hill commanding the valley of the oise the joy and i looked down upon the bright river and pretty city which joan had seen on that long ago afternoon of her last battle for france somewhere on that plain the battle had taken place and joan's little force for the first time had failed there had been a panic 
joan still fighting and trying to rally her men had been surrounded dragged from her horse and made a prisoner she had led her last charge we crossed a bridge and entered the city and stopped in the big public square facing larue's beautiful statue of joan which the later friends of compiègne have raised to her memory it is joan in semi-armor holding aloft her banner and on the base in old french is inscribed je vrai voir mes bons amis de compiègne i will go to see my good friends of compiègne many things in compiègne are beautiful but not many of them are very old joan's statue looks toward the handsome and richly ornamented hotel de ville but joan could not have seen this building for it dates a hundred years after her death there are the handsome churches in one or both of which she doubtless worshipped when she first had delivered the city and possibly a few houses of that ancient time still survive next morning we visited the palace it has been much occupied by royalty for compiegne was always a favorite residence of the rulers of france napoleon came there with the empress marie louise and louis de philippe and napoleon the third both found retirement here i think it could not have been a very inviting or restful home there are long halls and picture galleries all with shiny floors and stiffly placed properties and the royal suites are just a series of square fancily decorated and upholstered boxes strung together with doors between but then palaces were not meant to be cosy pretty soon we went back to the car and drove into a big forest for ten miles or more to an old feudal castle such a magnificent old castle all towers and turrets and battlements the chateau of pierrefonds one of the finest in france it stands upon a rocky height overlooking a lake and it does not seem so old though it had been there forty years when joan of arc came and it looks as if it might remain there about as long as the hill it stands on it was built by louis of orleans brother of charles the sixth and the storm of battle has often raged about its base here and there it still shows the mark of bombardment and two cannonballs stick fast in the wall of one of its solid towers pierrefonds was in bad repair and had become well-nigh a ruin in fact when napoleon the third at his own expense engaged Vieux le duc to restore it in order that france might have a perfect type of the feudal castle in its original form it stands to-day as complete in its structure and decoration as it was when louis of norleon moved in more than five hundred years ago and it conveys exactly the solid home surroundings of the medieval lord it is just a show-place now and its vast court and its chapel and halls of state are all splendid enough though nothing inside can be quite as magnificent as its mighty assemblage of towers and turrets rising above the trees and reflecting in the blue waters of a placid lake it began raining before we got to paris so we did not stop at crepy en valois or saint lys or chantilly or saint denis in fact neither the joy nor i hungered even for paris which we had once visited the others had already seen their fill so with only a day's delay we all took the road to versailles it was at rambouillet that we lodged an ancient place with a chateau and a vast park also an excellent inn the croix blanche one of those that you enter by driving through to an inner court before dinner we took a walk into the park along the lakeside and past the chateau where francis i died in fifteen forty seven we were off next morning following the rich and lovely valley of the eure to chartres we had already seen the towers from a long distance when we turned at last into the cathedral square and remembered the saying that the choir of beauvais and the nave of amiens the portal of Reims, and the towers of chartres would together make the finest church in the world to confess the truth i did not think the towers of chartres as handsome as those of rouen but then i am not a purist in cathedral architecture certainly the cathedral itself is glorious i shall not attempt to describe it any number of men have written books trying to do that and most of them have failed 
i only know that the wonder of its architecture the marvel of its relief carving lace in stone and the sublime glory of its windows somehow possessed us and we did not know when to go i met a woman once who said she had spent a month at chartres and put in most of it sitting in the cathedral looking at those windows when she told me of it i had been inclined to be scornful i was not so any more those windows made by some unknown artist dead five hundred years invite a lifetime of contemplation we left chartres by one of the old city gates and through a heavenly june afternoon followed the straight level way to chateau Dum, an ancient town perched upon the high cliff above the valley of the loire which is a different river from the loire much smaller and more picturesque the chateau itself hangs on the very verge of the cliffs with startling effect and looks out over a picture valley as beautiful as any in france this was the home of Danois, who left it to fight under joan of arc he was a great soldier one of her most loved and trusted generals we spent an hour or more wandering through Danois's ancient seat with an old guardian who clearly was in love with every stone of it and who time and again reminded us that it was more interesting than any of the great chateaux of the loire Blois especially in that it had been scarcely restored at all about the latest addition to chateau was a beautiful open stairway of the sixteenth century in perfect condition to-day on the other side is another fine façade and stairway which Demois himself added in a niche there stands a statue of the famous old soldier probably made from life if only some sculptor or painter might have preserved for us the features of joan through that golden land which lies between the loire and the loire we drifted through a long summer afternoon and came at evening to a noble bridge that crossed a wide tranquil river beyond which rose the towers of ancient tours capital of touraine the touraine was a favourite place for kings who built their magnificent country palaces in all directions there are more than fifty chateaux within easy driving distance of tours we did not by any means intend to visit all of the chateau for chateau visiting from a diversion may easily degenerate into labour we had planned especially however to see chinon where joan of arc went to meet the king to ask for soldiers this is not on the loire but on a tributary a little south of it the vienne with the castle crowning the long hill or ridge above the town some time during the afternoon we came to the outskirts of the ancient place and looked up to the ruined battlements and towers where occurred that meeting which meant the liberation of france the chateau to-day is the ruin of what originally was three chateaus built at different times but closely strung together so that in ruin they are scarcely divided the oldest coudre was built in the tenth century and still shows three towers standing in one of which joan of arc lived during her stay at chinon the middle chateau was built a hundred years later on the site of a roman fort and it was in one of its rooms a fragment of which still remains that charles the seventh received the shepherd girl from domremy the chateau of st george was built in the twelfth century by henry the second of england who died there in eleven eighty nine though built two hundred years later than coudre nothing remains of it to-day but some foundations chinon is a much more extensive ruin than we had expected even what remains must be nearly a quarter of a mile in length and its vast crumbling walls and crenellated towers make it strikingly picturesque but its ruin is complete none the less once through the entrance tower and you are under nothing but the sky with your feet on the grass there is no longer a shelter there even for a fugitive king you wander about viewing it scarcely more than as a ruin at first a place for painting for seclusion for dreaming in the sun then all at once you are facing a wall in which halfway up where once was the second story there is a restored fireplace and a tablet which tells you that in this room charles the seventh received joan of arc it is not a room now it is just a wall a fragment with vines matting its ruined edges you cross a stone footbridge to the tower where joan lived and that also is open to the sky and bare and desolate 
while beyond it there was a little chapel where she prayed but that is gone there are other fragments in other towers but they merely serve as a setting for those which the intimate presence of joan made sacred the maid did not go immediately to the castle on her arrival in chinon she put up at an inn down in the town and waited the king's pleasure his paltering advisers kept him dallying and postponing his consent to see her but through the favour of his mother-in-law yolanda queen of sicily joan and her suite were presently housed in coudray the king was still unready to see joan she was only a stone's throw away now but the whisperings of his advisers kept her there when there were no further excuses for delay they contrived a trick a deception they persuaded the king to put another on the throne one like him and in his royal dress so that joan might pay homage to this make-believe king thus proving that she had no divine power or protection which would assist her in identifying the real one in the space where now is only green grass and sky and a broken wall charles the seventh and his court gathered to receive the shepherd girl who had come to restore his kingdom it was evening and the great hall was lighted and at one end of it was the throne with its imitation king and i suppose at the other this fireplace with its blazing logs down the centre of the room were the courtiers formed in two ranks facing so that joan might pass between them to the throne the occasion was one of great ceremony joan and her suite were welcomed with fine honours banners waved torches flared trumpets blown at intervals marked the stages of her progress down the great hall every show was made of paying her great honour everything that would distract her and blind her to their trick charles the seventh dressed as a simple courtier stood a little distance from the throne joan advancing to within a few steps of the pretended king raised her eyes then for a moment she stood silent puzzled they expected her to kneel and make obeisance but a moment later she turned and hurrying to the rightful charles dropped on her knee and gave him a heartfelt salutation she had never seen him and was without knowledge of his features the protectors she had known in her vision had not failed her it was perhaps the greatest moment in french history in the quest for outlying chateaux one is likely to forget that tours itself is very much worth while tours has been a city ever since france had a history and it fought against caesar as far back as fifty two b c it took its name from the gallic tribe of that section the turoni dwellers in the cliffs i dare say along the loire tours was beloved by french royalty it was the capital of a province as rich as it was beautiful among french provinces touraine was perhaps the aristocrat its language has been kept pure to this day the purest french in the world is spoken at tours the mechanic who made some repairs for me at the garage leaned on the mudguard during a brief intermission of that hottest of days and told me about the purity of the french language at tours and if there was anything wrong with his own locution my ear was not fine enough to detect it to me it seemed as limpid as something distilled imagine such a thing happening in say bridgeport tour is still proud still the aristocrat still royal the germans held tour during the early months of eighteen seventy one but there is now no trace of their occupation it was a bad dream which tour does not care even to remember tour contains a fine cathedral and the remains of what must have been a still finer one two noble towers so widely separated by streets and buildings that it is hard to imagine them ever having belonged to one structure they are a part of the business of tour now shops are under them lodgings in them one of these old relics is called the clock tower the other the tower of charlemagne because ricard his third queen was buried beneath it End of chapter seven chapter eight of travel stories retold from st nicholas by various this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight motoring through the golden age part two by albert bigelow payne 
it was a july morning when we got away from tours one of those sweltering mornings and i had spent an hour or two at the garage putting on all our repaired tires and one new one it was not a good morning for exercise and by the time we were ready to start i was a rag narcissa photographed me because she said she had never seen me look so interesting before she made me stand in the sun bareheaded and hold a tube in my hand as if i had not enough to bear already but i was repaid the moment we were off oh but it was cool and delicious gliding along the smooth shaded road one can almost afford to get as hot and sweltering and cross and gasping as i was for the sake of sitting back and looking across the wheel down a leafy avenue facing the breeze of your own making a delicious nectar that bathes you through and cools and rests and soothes an anodyne of peace by and by being really cool in mind and body we drew up abreast of a meadow which lay a little below the road a place with a brook and overspreading shade and with some men and women harvesting not far away we thought they would not mind if we lunched there and i think they must have been as kind-hearted as they were picturesque for they did not offer to disturb us it was a lovely spot and did not seem to belong to the present-day world at all how could it with the homes of the old french kings all about and with these haymakers whose fashions have not minded the centuries here in plain view to make us seem a part of an ancient tale chenonceau the real heart of the royal district is not on the Loire itself but on a small tributary the cher i do not remember that i noticed the river when we entered the grounds but it is a very important part of the chateau which indeed is really a bridge over it a supremely beautiful bridge to be sure but a bridge none the less entirely crossing the pretty river by means of a series of high foundation arches upon these arches rises the rare edifice which thomas bohier a receiver-general of taxes began back in fifteen fifteen bohier did not extend chenonceau entirely across the river the river to him merely served as a moat the son who followed him did not have time to make additions francis i came along noticed that it was different from the other chateau he had confiscated and added it to his collection our present-day collectors cut a poor figure by the side of francis i think of getting together assortments of coins and postage stamps and ginger jars when one could go out and pick up chateaux it was the famous catherine de medici a daughter-in-law of francis i who finished the palace extending it across the cher making it one of the most beautiful places in the world we stopped a little to look at the beautiful facade of chenonceau then crossed the drawbridge or what is now the substitute for it and were welcomed at the door by just the proper person a fine dignified woman of gentle voice and perfect knowledge she showed us through the beautiful home for it is still a home having been bought by mr meunier of chocolate fame and fortune i cannot say how glad i am that mr meunier purchased chenonceau he did nothing to the place to spoil it and it is not a museum the lower rooms which we saw have many of the original furnishings the ornaments the tapestries the pictures are the same there is hardly another place i think where one may come so nearly stepping back through the centuries we went out into the long wing that is built on the arches above the river and looked down on the water flowing below our conductor told us that the supporting arches had been built on the foundations of an ancient mill the beautiful gallery which the ridge supports must have known much gaiety much dancing and promenading up and down many gallant speeches and some heartache the joy wanted to see the dungeons but perhaps there never were any real dungeons at chenonceau let us try to think so orleans is on the loire and we drove to it in the early morning from ming where we had spent the night i do not know what could be more lovely than that leisurely hour the distance was fifteen miles under cool outspreading branches with glimpses of the bright river and vistas of happy fields we did not even try to imagine as we approached the outskirts that the orleans of joan's time presented anything of its appearance to-day 
orleans is a modern or modernized city and except the river there could hardly be anything in the prospect that joan saw but it was the scene of her first military conquest and added its name to the title by which she belongs to history that is enough to make it one of the holy places of france it has been always a military city a place of battles caesar burned it attila attacked it clovis captured it there was often war of one sort or another going on there the english and burgundians would have had it in fourteen twenty nine but for the arrival of joan's army joan was misled by her generals whose faith in her was not complete orleans lies on the north bank of the loire they brought her down on the south bank fearing the prowess of the enemy's forces discovering the deception the maid promptly sent the main body of her troops back some thirty-five miles to a safe crossing and taking a thousand men passed over the loire and entered the city by a gate which was still held by the french that the city was not completely surrounded made it possible to attack the enemy from within and without while her presence among the orleans would inspire them with new hope and valor mark twain in his recollections pictures the great moment of her entry it was eight in the evening when she and the troops rode in at the burgundy gate she was riding a white horse and she carried in her hand the sacred sword of fierbois you should have seen orleans then what a picture it was such black seas of people such a starry firmament of torches such roaring whirlwinds of welcome such booming of bells and thundering of cannon it was as if the world was come to an end everywhere in the glare of the torches one saw rank upon rank of upturned white faces the mouths wide open shouting and the unchecked tears running down joan forged her slow way through the solid masses her mailed form projecting above the pavement of heads like a silver statue the people about her struggled along gazing up at her through their tears with the rapt look of men and women who believe they were seeing one who is divine and always her feet were being kissed by grateful folk and such as failed of that privilege touched her horse and then kissed their fingers this was the twenty ninth of april nine days later may eighth fourteen twenty nine after some fierce fighting during which joan was severely wounded the besiegers were scattered orleans was free mark twain writes no other girl in all history has ever reached such a summit of glory as joan of arc reached that day orleans will never forget the eighth of may nor ever fail to celebrate it it is joan of arc's day and holy two days may seventh and eighth are given each year to the celebration and orleans in other ways has honored the memory of her deliverer a wide street bears her name and there are noble statues and a museum and church offerings the boucher home which sheltered joan during her sojourn in orleans has been preserved at least a house is still shown as the boucher house though how much of the original structure remains no one of this day seems willing to decide we drove there first for it is the only spot in orleans that can claim even a possibility of having known joan's actual presence it is a house of the old half-timbered architecture and if these are not the veritable walls that joan saw they must at least bear a close resemblance to those of the house of jacques boucher a treasurer of the duke of orleans where joan was made welcome a few doors away is a fine old mansion now a museum and fairly overflowing with objects of every conceivable sort relating to joan of arc books statuary paintings armor banners offerings coins medals ornaments engravings letters thousands upon thousands of articles gathered here in the maid's memory i think there is not one of them that her hand ever touched or that she ever saw but in their entirety they convey as nothing else could the reverence that joan's memory inspired during the centuries that have gone since her presence made this ground sacred until the revolution orleans preserved joan's banner some of her clothing and other genuine relics but then the mob burned them possibly because joan delivered france to royalty we were shown an ancient copy of the banner still born i believe in the annual festivities 
Baedeker speaks of arms and armor worn at the siege of Orléans, but the guardian of the place was not willing to guarantee their genuineness. I think Narcissa, who worships the memory of Joan, was almost sorry that he thought it necessary to be so honest. He did show us a photograph of Joan's signature. She wrote a Jehan, and her pen must have been guided by her secretary, for Joan could neither read nor write. We drove to the Place Martois to see the large equestrian statue of Joan by Foyetier, with reliefs by Vital Dubray. It is very imposing, and the reliefs, showing the great moments in Joan's career, are really fine. We did not care to hunt for other memorials. It was enough to drive about the city, trying to pick out a house here and there that looked as if it might have been standing five hundred years. But if there were any of that age, any that had looked upon the wild joy of Joan's entrance and upon her triumphal departure, they were very few indeed. It is a grand and straight road from Orléans to Fontainebleau, and it passes through Pithiers, which did not look especially interesting, though we discovered, when it was too late, that it is noted for its almond cakes and lark pies. I wanted to go back then, but the majority decided against me, and in the late afternoon we entered the majestic royal forest, and by and by came to the palace and the little town, and to a pretty hotel on a side street that was really a village inn for comfort and welcome. There was still plenty of daylight, mellow, waning daylight, and the palace was not far away. We would not wait for it until morning i think we most enjoyed seeing palaces about the closing hour there are seldom any other visitors then and the fading afternoon sunlight in the vacant rooms softens their garish emptiness and seems somehow to bring nearer the rich pageant of life and love and death that flowed through them so long and then one day came to an end and now it is not passing any more it was really closing time when we arrived at the palace but the custodian was lenient and for an hour we wandered through gorgeous galleries and salons and suites of private apartments where kings and queens lived gladly loved madly died sadly for about three hundred years francis i built fontainebleau on the site of a medieval castle he was a hunter and the forests of fontainebleau were always famous hunting grounds louis the thirteenth who was born at fontainebleau built a grand entrance staircase from which a hundred years later napoleon bonaparte bade good-bye to his generals before starting for elba other kings have added to the place and embellished it the last being napoleon the third who built for eugene the bijou theatre across the court it may have been our mood it may have been the tranquil evening light it may have been reality that fontainebleau was more friendly more alive more a place for living men and women to inhabit than any other palace we have seen it was hard to imagine versailles as having ever been a home for anybody at fontainebleau i felt that we were intruding that marie antoinette marie louise or eugene might enter at any moment and find us there the apartments of the first napoleon and marie louise tell something too but the story seems less intimate yet the table is there on which napoleon signed his abdication while an escort waited to take him to elba and in his study is his writing table and there is a bust by canova but that is marble and does not encourage the thought of life for size and magnificence, the library is the most impressive room in Fontainebleau. It is very lofty, very splendid, and it is 264 feet long. Napoleon III gave great hunting banquets there. Since then, it has always been empty, except for visitors. The light was getting dim by the time we reached the pretty theater, which Louis Napoleon built for Eugène it is a very choice place and we were allowed to go on the stage and behind the scenes and up in the galleries and there was something in the dusky vacancy of that little playhouse built to amuse the last empress of france that affected us almost more than any of the rest of the palace though it was built not so long ago and its owner is still alive it is not used the custodian told us has never been used since eugenie went away 
i believe nothing at fontainebleau gave more delight to narcissa and the joy than this dainty theatre from a terrace back of the palace we looked out on a pretty lake where eugenie's son used to sail a miniature full-rigged ship large enough if one could judge from a picture we saw to have held the little prince himself there was still sunlight on the treetops and these and the prince's pretty pavilion reflecting in the placid water made the place beautiful but the little vessel was not there i wished as we watched that it might come sailing by i wished that the prince had never been exiled and that he had not grown up and gone to his death in a south african jungle i wished that he might be back to sail his ship again and that eugenie might be young and have her theatre once more and that louis napoleon's hunting parties might still gather in the painted ballroom and fill the vacant palace with something besides mere curiosity and vain imaginings we had meant to go to barbizon home of the artist millet but we got lost in the forest next morning and when we found ourselves we were a good way in the direction of melon and concluded to keep on consoling ourselves with the thought that barbizon is not barbizon any more and would probably be a disappointment anyway we kept on from melun also buying some luncheon things and all day traversed that beautiful rolling district which lies east of paris and below Reims, arriving toward evening at epernay centre of the champagne district we had no need to linger there we were anxious to get to Reims. we were still in the hills when we looked on the valley of the vessel and saw a city outspread there and in its centre mellowed and glorified by seven kindly centuries the architectural and ecclesiastical pride of the world the cathedral of Reims. large as the city was that great central ornament dwarfed and dominated its surroundings thus joan of arc had seen it when at the head of her victorious army she conducted the king to Reims for his coronation she approached the fulfilment of her mission the completion of the great labor laid upon her by the voices of her saints mark twain tells of joan's approach to Reims, of the tide of cheers that swept her ranks at the vision of the distant towers it was the sixteenth of july that joan looked down upon Rance, and now four hundred and eighty-five years later it was again july with the same summer glory on the wood the same green and scarlet in the poppied fields the same fair valley the same stately towers rising to the sky but no one can ever feel what joan felt can ever put into words ever so faintly what that moment and that vision meant to the domremy shepherd girl descending the plain we entered the city crossed a bridge and made our way to the cathedral square there presently we were at the door where joan and her king had entered the portal which has been called the most beautiful this side of paradise how little we dreamed that destruction and disfigurement lay only a few weeks ahead it is not required any more that one should write descriptively of the now banished glories of the church of Reims. it has been done so thoroughly and so numerously by those so highly qualified for the undertaking ferguson who must have been an authority for the guide-book quotes him calls it perhaps the most beautiful structure produced in the middle ages the cathedral was already two hundred years old when joan arrived in fourteen twenty nine but it must have looked quite fresh and new then for nearly five centuries later it seemed to have suffered little some of the five hundred and thirty statues of its wonderful portal were weather-worn and scarred to be sure but the general effect of beauty and completeness was not disturbed many kings had preceded joan and her sovereign through the sacred entrance long before the cathedral was built french sovereigns had come to Reims for their coronation here clovis had been baptized nearly a thousand years before it was a mighty assemblage that gathered for the crowning of joan's king france overrun by an invader had known no real king for years had indeed well-nigh surrendered her nationality now victory in the person of a young girl from an obscure village had crowned their arms and brought redemption to their throne no wonder the vast church was packed and that crowds were massed outside from all directions had come pilgrims to the great event 
persons of every rank among them two shepherds joan's aged father and uncle who had walked from domremy one hundred and twenty miles to verify with their own eyes what their ears could not credit we are told that the abbot attended by the archbishop his canons and a deputation of nobles entered the crowded church followed by the five mounted knights who rode down the great central aisle clear to the choir and then at a signal backed their prancing steeds all the distance to the great doors very likely the cathedral at rance had never known such a throng until that day nor heard such a mighty shout as went up when joan and the king side by side and followed by a splendid train appeared at the great side entrance and moved slowly to the altar i think there must have fallen a deep hush then a petrified stillness that lasted through the long ceremonial while every eye feasted itself upon the young girl standing there at the king's side holding her victorious standard above him the banner that had borne the burden and had earned the victory as she would one day testify at her trial i am sure that vast throng would keep silence scarcely breathing until the final word was spoken and the dauphin had accepted the crown and placed it upon his head but then we may hear borne faintly down the centuries the roar of renewed shouting that told to those waiting without that the great ceremony was ended that charles the seventh of france had been anointed king as in a picture we seem to see the shepherd girl on her knees saying to the crowned king my work which was given me to do is finished give me your peace and let me go back to my mother who is poor and old and has need of me but the king raises her up and praises her and confers upon her nobility and titles and asks her to name a reward for her service and we hear her ask that domremy poor and hard pressed by reason of the war may have its taxes remitted nothing for herself no more than that and in the presence of all the great assemblage charles the seventh decreed that by grace of joan of arc domremy should be free from taxes for ever there within those walls it was all reality five hundred years ago one did not study the interior to discover special art values or to distinguish in what manner it differed from others we had seen for us the light from its great rose window and upper arches was glorified because once it fell upon joan of arc in that supreme moment when she saw her labor finished and asked only that she might return to domremy and her flocks the statues in the niches were sacred because they looked upon that scene the altar paving was sanctified because it felt the presence of her feet back of the altar stood a statue of joan unlike any we had seen elsewhere and to us more beautiful it was not joan with her banner aloft her eyes upward it was joan with her eyes lowered looking at no outward thing her face passive the saddest face and the saddest eyes in the world joan the sacrifice of her people and her king it may have been two miles out of rance that we met the flood there had been one heavy shower as we entered the city but presently the sun broke out bright and hot too bright and too hot for permanence now suddenly all was black again there was a roar of thunder and then such an opening of the water gates of the sky as would have disturbed noah i turned the car over to the side of the road but the tall high-trimmed trees afforded no protection our top was a shelter but not a complete one the wind drove the water in and in a moment our umbrellas were sticking out in every direction and we had huddled together like chickens the world was blotted out i had the feeling at moments that we were being swept down some great submarine current i don't know how long the inundation lasted it may have been five minutes or thirty then suddenly it stopped it was over the sun was out there was then no mud in france not in the high roads and a moment or two later we had revived our engine was going and we were gliding between fair fields fresh shining fields where scarlet poppy patches were as pools of blood 
how peaceful it all was then for there is no lovelier land than the marne district from reims to chalons and to vitry la francois yet it has been often a war district a battleground it has been fought over time and again since the ancient allies defeated attila and his sons there checking the purpose of the scourge of god as he called himself it could never be a battleground again we thought the great nations were too advanced for war ah me within two months from that day men were lying dead across that very road shells were tearing at the lovely fields and another stain had mingled with the trampled poppies chalons sur marne like reims and epernay is a champagne district and seemed prosperous there are some churches there but they did not seem of great importance it was in july when we were on the marne in an earlier chapter i have told how only three weeks later when we had reached vevy switzerland the great upheaval came and with what disturbing consequences we did not leave europe with the early rush for a time we hesitated about leaving at all but then uncertainties increased with italy planning war the possibility of not being able to leave when we were ready was not comforting so in october at last we got a military pass to take the car out of switzerland and on one of the last days of the month set off up the rhone valley down which caesar's armies once had marched and drove to brieg and the next day crossed the simplon pass up and up more than six thousand feet where the snow was flying and where there are no villages any more but only a hospice and here and there a wayside shelter then through a wild savage-looking land down and down into italy arriving in the rain at domodossola glad oh so glad for safe shelter and food and beds i will not tell here of our months wandering in italy but one day our reliable car was loaded on a vessel for home and a little later we were aboard the same ship breasting such storms as made it seem impossible that only a little while before we had been in a sunny land gliding smoothly over a solid surface that did not heave and toss and roar day and night without end then by and by a day came when we were gliding once more over smooth solid ground this time in our own land far from the quaint villages the bright rivers the ancient castles the sunny slopes and perfect roads of france yet america is not without its glories and though it has fewer quaint villages and no ancient castles it has at least as fair scenery as fertile lands and its roads are growing better and more numerous every day our wayside inns will improve too i am sure of it until america like france may become another paradise narcissa and the joy were patriotic enough to be gladdened at the sight of new england shores and hillsides and as narcissa says well if we didn't see america first we'll probably have plenty of time to see it now End of chapter eight chapter nine of travel stories retold from st nicholas by various this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter nine letter boxes in foreign lands by a r roy the first letter box ever used was established in paris in fifteen sixty it is true that a kind of letter box was in use in italy before that time it was not used however by the postal service but as a place for denunciations directed to the police the first letter box in germany was established in seventeen sixty six in berlin at first the boxes were simple both for depositing letters and for removing them the cover was lifted during the last century a great many different styles of boxes have been introduced but the so-called swedish system is now in universal use in germany the letter boxes are highly ornamental and in many cases made especially to be in harmony with the architecture of the building to which they are fastened they are painted blue and show the coat of arms of the empire and that of the postal department a post horn with tassels 
the mail is removed by fastening a bag to the bottom of the box the bag is slipped in and opens and closes automatically the postman does not handle or even see the letters and cannot get at them in london large letter boxes are placed on the sidewalk at nearly every street corner they have different compartments for city and country mail and this as well as the height of the apertures makes them rather inconvenient for any but grown people while they are painted a brilliant red and therefore very conspicuous they are by no means an embellishment to the city the letters are taken out by opening a large door and literally shoveling the mail matter into a bag the letter-box in the general post office in england is a magnificent construction the signboard is made of brass on which the directions are engraved in ink large slits provide for the country and colonial mails and there is also a different compartment for newspapers and parcels the modern french letter-box has the shape of a pillar profusely ornamented with the conventional lily the whole box or stand is fashioned after a plant and the top resembles a bud the body is surrounded by floral wreaths or festoons and the base is formed by large leaves the boxes are placed against buildings and have a very pretty effect in brussels the government keeps pace with the needs of the people and has attached postal boxes to the rear ends of cars in the city this aids and hastens the delivery of letters and telegrams as most of these cars pass the post offices where the boxes are emptied this street car letter box in fact virtually takes the place of the pneumatic tube postal system for which london and berlin have become famous the russian post box is an old-fashioned awkward-looking box it looks something like a peasant hut the roof is lifted up and the letters are taken out from the top the postman handles the letters as freely as the sorters themselves in times past the governmental power in russia was so strict that it is believed the post office officials frequently opened letters suspected of being connected with plots against the state and read them the italian post boxes are prettily constructed and grouped together in threes and fours one box is used for the city another for the country and by the side is a big automatic machine for stamps a penny in the slot supplies the various kinds of stamps required the amsterdam letter pillar is of very artistic construction which is both pleasing to the eye and practical the royal arms are conspicuously and prettily embossed on the face of the box and below them are two rosettes of conventional style there are two letter slits one for the country and one for the city the top is crowned with ornamental bowers right above the pillar is a board on which the times of delivery and collection are clearly written the roumanian letter boxes are all numbered in large letters so as to help the public to keep track of where they post their mail and also the postman in his collection it is a simple square box which is placed generally on the walls of large buildings in the main streets throughout the orient where the national influences are many and various each country has its own post office for instance the british have their own and the french and the germans theirs the stamps used by each of these post offices are of course their own there not being a universal system for all countries right on the city gate in tangier we find in this town of an old civilization the convenience of most modern time a letter-box before the natives were used to them they were considered as wonderful machines into which a missive once being put was mysteriously conveyed to its destination and they were generally feared to-day the smallest boy uses them the style of course varies with the power that puts it up here we can notice with what expression of wonderment the native posts a letter he is only certain the letter will go but how he does not know the german post box is painted blue and has only german directions written on it the directions giving time of delivery and collection are written in many languages the final photograph shows a letter box on a moorish gateway in tangier morocco
and here this convenience of modern days looks strange in its surroundings of arabic fresco and characters no attempt has been made to harmonize with the moorish architecture the letters are collected from an opening on the other side of the wall End of chapter nine chapter ten of travel stories retold from st nicholas by various this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter ten lost reims by louise eugenie pickett reims which has been on fire for a week is now nothing but a great pile of smoking ruins i read in the paper of the man who sat next to me in the subway with a sick heart i read on there are no traces of streets and thoroughfares which have disappeared from view under the accumulation of debris ancient buildings in the place royale and the market-place and the musician's house which dates from the sixteenth century have been reduced to dust and ashes with a doubly sad heart i read it for to me it is more than an old french city that lies in ruins since with it goes the picturesque and historic background of my early youth it is the tragic passing of my city of dreams for there i dreamed away eight happy years of girlhood it is an enviable thing to live in an ancient city like reims till its history becomes a part of the texture of one's mind till the background of that history hangs like a series of distinct pictures in one's thought not to be effaced by anything that shall come afterwards the streets of reims as they then stood are photographed clearly on the retina of my mind's eye and dominating all as it did at my first sight of it is the majestic shape of the cathedral i enter again in imagination those beautiful portals and feel myself a tiny figure and young in the midst of hoary antiquity the organ music surges through the building the choir boys voices soar above it i see again the slanting fall of colored light across the wide gray floors the soft blue smoke of the rising incense the towering pillars the vaulted roof the dim vistas ending in the splendor of painted windows years and years of patient labor it took to rear this marvel it represented the ideality of an age it was in fact that ideality incarnate left standing for all posterity to see and take inspiration from it was at sunset one december day that i first entered rance it was to be my home for the next eight years for my father had been appointed by the american government to be consul there how eagerly i remember we looked out of the train window as we approached the city long before the town itself became distinct to our eyes we could plainly see the cathedral a superb silhouette imposing and not to be forgotten it was like one's first view of the ocean or the mountains or the desert that night we slept opposite the cathedral in the eighteenth century hotel lyon d'or i recollect the thrill of excitement my sister and i felt as the big bus rattled into the courtyard of that quaint hostelry and agile valets in yellow and black striped waistcoats ran to open the door for us we felt that we were at last to live a story-book life of adventure and romance the deep-toned bells of the cathedral awakened us at dawn and in the pale light we rushed to the windows to look out on the sculptured facade of the wonderful building in order that we might feel again the strange charm that had so wrought upon us at our first sight of it in the open square before us a valiant figure caught our attention a figure of bronze that sat upon a spirited charger and held aloft a spear jean d'arc before the cathedral that had witnessed her brief hour of glory the story we knew well but shape and color it had never had before the centuries before ours had been hardly more to us than arabian nights tales yet here was the visible evidence of the mighty procession of people who had existed before our day we could not take the shortest walk in the city without being reminded of the dim perspective of history stretching far back of our youth for here it was written in tangible and enduring stone 
at the rear of the hotel lion d'or we could see the old hotel of the sign of the maison rouge where the father and mother of jean d'arc were housed at the time of the crowning of the dauphin we could walk over the cobblestone of the narrow rue de tambour which was once so history says one of the largest and most frequented of the streets of rance we could look up at the maison des musiciens so old a building that no one knows for what it was originally built on its quaint facade how often we curiously examined the broken figures of the sculptured musicians for this was the street down which the royal processions passed on their way to the coronation at the cathedral the soldiers in the vanguard had struck and broken the statues with their spears to make way for the banners and pennants of the brilliant cavalcade how full of colour and splendour the street must have appeared then but that was all past and the musicians in our time looked down only upon market women trundling their wares through to the market-place beyond the old building nevertheless still served to recreate in the fancy of two wondering girls those stately yesterdays in the rue carnot how often we paused to glance up at a curious archway supporting two round towers old very old it looked and no wonder for it dated from the middle ages under the arch we could catch a glimpse of the walls of the cathedral grey as frost and the prison with beggars sitting in its grim shadow how the past centuries peered out at us from every corner showing in quaint portals such as the one on the school of the petit lycee with bas-reliefs of a laughing child on one side and a crying one on the other known to the bons enfants since the beginning of the school as jean qui rit et jean qui pleure or that of the old house of the la salle family in the rue de l'arbalète with its life-size figures of adam and eve to guard the entrance when we walked down the rue cerise we passed the houses where louis the fourteenth's famous minister colbert was born and often pictured him coming out of the wide doorway the courtly velvet-clad figure that the portrait of him in the art museum had made familiar to our minds for many a trip we made to the hotel de ville to see the paintings and the wonderful illuminated books in the library and the beautiful old building itself we would often stop i remember to read the list of marriages posted in the vestibule the maries the yvonnes and the marguerites the jeans the marcels and pierres who were to live happily ever after or so we confidently believed several years later the elder sister came with her lover to read shyly her own for the old and dignified salle de mariage was to be the background of her romance too we had read dumas and anne of austria as every one knows figures largely in his tales but that she was more real than d'artagnan we had hardly conceived until one day we stood before the seventeenth century house in the rue de l'université which once had the honour of sheltering her it belonged to jean Mellefeu, and he has left an account of the visit in quaintly spelled old french which we were fortunate enough to have chance to read he was very proud of the magnificence of his dwelling and spread his luxury before us as a peacock might spread his gorgeous tail for humbler birds to admire it was fit for a queen he felt and lo she was coming he describes exultantly the sound of the trumpets that signalized the consequential arrival of royalty ta ta ra ta ta ra ta ta ra que d'honneurs qui vont tomber sur mes faibles épaules what honours to fall upon my poor shoulders the pride of the seventeenth century how laughably like it is to that of the twentieth the queen as she entered jestingly said the house is my own yes grande princesse you are right responded its owner quickly at the same time the marshal du plessis asked of him monsieur are you the master of this house monsieur replied the gallant gentleman of rance bowing with a grand air i make no doubt monsieur i was but a moment ago but when the sun appears the stars are eclipsed 
in the rue de la grue we searched out the house where was born tronson de coudre an eloquent lawyer of the paris parliament and the courageous defender of marie antoinette with all our young enthusiasm we loved him as the champion of the ill-fated queen the porte de paris the great iron gateway in reims the guide-books told us was a triumph of the smith's art but it held our imaginations in thrall because it had been built in honour of the crowning of louis the sixteenth and marie antoinette somewhere we had found an account of the coronation and read how joyously they had entered the city and how in the cathedral in the midst of the acclamations and applause so loud and prolonged that they covered the sound of the bells and the noise of the cannon the gracieuse marie antoinette had fainted and thus elle a perdu quelques instants de plus beau jour de sa vie she had lost some moments of the most beautiful day of her life we loved to imagine her against the background of that rich interior of the cathedral the light through its glowing windows touching with iridescence the tall grey pillars the royal pennants and draperies bright tones against the sombre hues of the marvellous tapestries gold flashing here and there from tall candlesticks and brilliant uniforms wonderful gems catching fire from the great arched windows that seemed in the brightness of the sun to be themselves made of rival jewels a splendid setting for the most beautiful day of her life the height the space the gloom the glory how they typified that life the porte de paris too was eloquent of the fierce days of the revolution the people of reims tell how the mob one day came surging toward it when the ringleaders proposed that they destroy the gilded crown upon its apex as the symbol of hated royalty then the mayor a man of tactful resource called to the most furious of the band and asked if he had a ten sou piece at his service the man readily passed it to him whereupon the mayor at once gave it to a beggar standing near take it said he monsieur will have nothing with the crown upon it every one laughed and the crown on the gate was saved under the wide arch of the porte de paris victorious napoleon entered after the prussian occupation of the city in eighteen fourteen it was already nightfall when the fierce battle was fought and not until eleven o'clock was napoleon able to enter the city what an ovation he received from the rejoicing citizens the Rémois. it thrilled us to read it all at once the great bells of the cathedral thundered forth a welcome while at the same time every window in the town was lighted and a great cry of vive l'empereur rang from end to end of the city the house in the rue de vesle where he slept that night is an old acquaintance if the porte de paris seemed old to us and eloquent of the past what was to be said of the grey old arch known as the porte de mar that dated before christ and spoke aloud for future times to hear of the triumphs of great caesar and of the gallo roman days and what of the market-place which was once we were told the roman forum even in our time though all traces of the forum were gone the market-place was an ancient-looking square edged as it was with quaint old buildings among them notably an elaborately carved wooden house one of the most curious specimens of fifteenth-century art near by was the old church of st jacques often we used to steal in to rest awhile in its rainbow-coloured twilight not as imposing as the cathedral but very lovely nevertheless it was one of the relics of the twelfth century the cathedral st jacques and the old abbey church of st remy they have formed for us the beautiful and impressive backgrounds of many a wedding and funeral and quaint religious service many a time we have threaded the queer old streets of reims with their queer old names the rue de la clef street of the quay the rue des deux anges street of the two angels the rue des trois raisinettes street of the three little grapes the maison des quatre chats gringlantes house of the four grinning cats the auberge du lapin grand tavern of the fat rabbit 
curious old buildings of the middle ages we pass them by in our youth but we shall carry the memory of them into our old age how tranquil the city used to seem to us then too quiet sometimes a drowsy old town we said sitting like venerable age sleeping in the sun how little we dreamed what a cruel awakening was in store for it that horror and terror were to stalk through all those peaceful streets and leave their dreadful scars behind end of chapter ten chapter eleven of travel stories retold from st nicholas by various this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven where dorothy vernon dwelt by mina b Noyes in rowsley england the quaint old peacock inn with its vine-covered walls casement windows and rare old gardens is the picture of peace and comfort and it is also a perfect type of the hostelries of bygone days if the guest can tear himself away from its ease and plenty its stately gardens and its soothing atmosphere the surrounding country affords many delightful walks and attractions both historical and romantic following the pretty little river wye one soon comes to haddon hall one of the best specimens of medieval domestic architecture now in existence although it has been added to at various periods from the eleventh to the sixteenth centuries it was given by william the conqueror to one of his sons william peverell scott's peverell of the peak and is now the property of the duke of rutland a descendant of the beautiful dorothy vernon whose romantic elopement with john manners has been celebrated in drama song and story and lends an especial interest to the old castle the vernons lived at haddon hall from eleven ninety five to fifteen sixty seven and among the many beautiful women of their line the most beautiful is said to have been the self-willed dorothy her youthful love dream was thwarted by her equally obstinate father some say because of family feuds others say on account of difference in religion whatever the cause parental opposition was so strong that one night when a grand ball was in progress in the famous ballroom of haddon hall the heiress stole away through the door of the anteroom and fled in all her festive array along dorothy's walk a long terrace lined with stately yews down the long flight of steps to the lower terrace and over the little bridge to her waiting lover he carried her away on his fleet steed to a hasty morning wedding carefully placing many miles between the irate father and the lovely bride dorothy's father sir george vernon the king of the peak allowed his wrath to cool in time and the happy couple returned and made their home at the hall john manners was a younger son of the earl of rutland and father of the first duke of rutland whose cradle is now exhibited in the state bedroom of haddon hall the great ballroom from which miss dorothy fled is over one hundred feet long eighteen feet wide and fifteen feet high on the south side toward the garden are three very large recessed windows and on the north side is a huge fireplace with ancient fire dogs at the east end of the room is a glass case containing a bust of grace lady manners wife of sir george manners this is said to have been made from a cast taken after death certainly the lady was far from beautiful if one judges from this representation of her charms the interior of the family chapel is in a semi-ruined state on the right there is a stoop for holy water about four hundred years old and just beyond it are the servant seats in the chancel are two large high family pews one on either side the master and his sons occupying one and the lady and her daughters the other the stained glass window in the chapel was of great beauty but early in the nineteenth century the greater part of it was mysteriously stolen in the night and its place has been filled with fragments of colored glass taken from other windows in the kitchen may still be seen the immense fireplace the large hollowed-out block evidently used for a chopping tray a salting trough and a few other pieces of culinary apparatus 
in the banqueting hall is the minstrel's gallery the front of which is carved and panelled and decorated with stag's antlers and there is also a gallery along one side probably of later construction the lord and his guests sat at one end of the hall on a raised platform while the retainers sat at tables in the body of the hall the high table is a remarkable specimen of its kind and one of the most interesting relics of feudal times at the north end of the hall just inside the entrance is a kind of handcuff fastened to the wall and so arranged as to hold a man's wrist up at arm's length while liquor was poured down his sleeve the punishment meted out to every guest who did not drink all that the laws of hospitality forced upon him over the banqueting hall is the drawing-room the walls still hung with ancient tapestries there is a great deal of beautiful old tapestry in haddon hall and it all seems to be woven or worked in small pieces even the shades of colouring being done separately and then sewed together another room shown to visitors is the state bedroom with old oil paintings and gobelin tapestry designed in panels on the borders of which are medallions with subjects from aesop's fables queen elizabeth is said to have once slept in this room and in a large window recess is a dressing-table with a mirror called queen elizabeth's looking-glass the poor queen's vanity must have received a shock when she saw herself reflected there or else the glass has become defective with age in this room there is also the primitive cradle said to be that of the first duke of rutland the state bed is large and imposing draped with faded green silk velvet lined with white satin dating from the reign of henry the sixth the last person to occupy this bed was george the fourth when he was prince regent there are some smaller and less interesting rooms to which the visitor may have access all by the small windows and the rude workmanship of doors and fastenings showing great antiquity a winding staircase of uneven stone steps leads to the peveril tower the highest part of the hall and from this tower there is a beautiful view of the valley of the wye and the hills and valleys around haddon hall is not used as a residence by its owner the duke of rutland but it is kept in reasonable repair and is visited yearly by hundreds of trippers from all parts of the british isles and by tourists from all countries to be appreciated fully it should be inspected leisurely and not done in the few minutes allowed some of the personally conducted visitors one lovely summer day we saw two large wagonettes filled with tourists drive up to the hall and the procession headed by a guide walked through the rooms and back to the waiting vehicles in less than half an hour we learned that these people were americans who had landed at liverpool that morning and after hastily viewing this fine old mansion they were to be taken to chatsworth house the duke of devonshire's country seat a few miles away while later in the day they were due in london for additional sightseeing it is small wonder if they had little appreciation of the beauties of venerable pile or modern mansion and but the vaguest memories of them after their return home haddon hall will repay one for frequent and extended visits as new points of interest will repeatedly reward the unhurried visitor and many a pleasant hour may be spent on the terraces looking out over the charming landscape and dreaming of bygone days when the hall was a stage for the drama of life with all its elements of love and hate of comedy and tragedy of peace and war End of chapter 11chapter twelve of travel stories retold from st nicholas by various this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve foreign fire brigades by charles t hill one summer while in switzerland i asked a prominent merchant of lausanne when his town had had its last serious fire not in three years he replied i was moved to ask this question because i had found the fire apparatus in padlocked barns or stations with the keys in the hands of the police who attended to the fire-fighting 
and this seemed as compared to the remarkably quick methods employed in america a somewhat dangerous form of fire protection lausanne is a town of about fifty thousand population and i wondered how many american cities of a like size could boast of only one serious fire in three years not many i imagine in lucerne a smaller city of switzerland of about forty thousand population the conditions were practically the same with the exception that each stable containing the fire apparatus had a notice posted on the door stating that the keys could be found in the neighboring hotels and drug shops and the citizens were expected to take out the engines in the event of a fire while the firemen volunteers came on call the alarm being sounded on all the church bells lucerne is a well-known tourist center heavily populated during the summer months and has many large shops filled with very inflammable material and a great many very old buildings and yet this place has had only two fires of any size within two years while i was attending the morning drill of the central fire station at dresden in saxony the captain in command told me that the city had on an average about six alarms of fire a week i casually remarked that we had twenty-five a day in new york he looked at me with wonderment and doubt and when i repeated that we actually had between twenty and thirty alarms of fire a day in the borough of manhattan alone he threw up his hands and exclaimed thank heaven it is not as bad as that here or our beautiful city would be destroyed and so we find thanks to superior building construction less hurry and rush in business methods and a wholesome regard on the part of the citizens for certain rigid laws covering the use of explosives and materials of all kinds which usually cause fire the lot of the foreign firefighter is not as strenuous as that of his brother firemen on this side of the water because of the excellent character of the buildings abroad fires burn slowly and rarely extend beyond the room or floor in which they start here on the other hand the conditions are entirely different our fires are larger more destructive and more frequent compelling us to support not only the most effective but most expensive fire departments in the world and yet in spite of all this our annual fire losses are from ten to twenty times more than those of any country in europe better building laws and the universal adoption of fire prevention ordinances are going to change all this for us in time but as yet our annual fire loss stuns the average european by its enormous total in london the fire department comes under the supervision of the city authorities the london county council looking after the administration of the metropolitan fire brigade as it is called and this brigade in management and routine work is not unlike many large american fire departments though the apparatus used is radically different a naval officer has always been chief of the london fire brigade and the firemen are usually recruited from the marine service a time-honored custom giving preference to men who have been at least five years at sea it is argued that the work of a fireman is of a nature more readily performed by a sailor who is not only accustomed to danger and exposure of all kinds but is trained to climbing and working in perilous positions these new men after passing a severe physical examination before a medical board are put through three months careful schooling at fire headquarters where they are not only taught how to handle every tool and implement used in the brigade but become skilled in life-saving work the fire stations in london are much larger than the engine houses found in american cities and some of the newer buildings in appearance are not unlike some of our better class apartment houses indeed this is practically what they are a kind of apartment house or barracks for the men and their families as well as a station for the apparatus and the horses and here the firemen live occupying little apartments of from three to five rooms according to their rank and position they are therefore in the houses and on duty at all times with the exception of one day's leave of absence in every fifteen 
enough firemen are found in each london fire station to make up three of our fire companies but only one-third of these men are in service or on call duty at a time the rest being held in reserve to answer any other alarms which might come in or to reinforce the first detachment leaving the house should their call prove to be a bad fire and the men of each squad or detachment on call duty are supposed to be fully dressed when an alarm comes in and have only to adjust their helmets which hang in long rows on the walls of the apparatus floor before jumping on the engines and no exception is made to this rule even with the men on the lass or night tour from nine p m until seven a m this accounts for the pictures we sometimes see showing the english firemen seated along the sides of their engines in military fashion fully uniformed in some of the stations the london fire brigade still clings to the rather old-fashioned custom of keeping the horses standing in harness in stables at the rear to be led out to the apparatus by hand in event of a call and this makes their turnout in answer to an alarm appear to us to be peculiarly slow one accustomed as we are to the remarkably quick methods employed in our fire departments but several of the newer houses built within the last few years are supplied with many ingenious american time-saving devices sliding poles swinging harnesses etc while the horses are kept in box stalls on the apparatus floor in convenient running distance of the engines all of which has considerably reduced the time consumed in turning out to an alarm the english fire engine is a small affair much smaller than our steam fire engines having about one-half the pumping capacity of the american engines and nearly every one in london is a combined engine and hose wagon the hose being carried in a box-like compartment on each side of the machine just back of the driver's seat this hose box serves as a convenient place for the fireman to sit while riding to the fire quite a number of automobile fire engines are in service in the london brigade big business-like looking machines about as large as some of our motor engines and capable of great speed while answering an alarm as a contrast to this up-to-date equipment a number of manuals or hand engines are in use which ought to have been sent to the scrap heap years ago in the way of ladder trucks they are very well supplied in london for in addition to several horse ladder escapes as they are called a fairly long extension ladder carried on a horse-drawn truck and which can be detached from this truck and pushed close to a building they have a great many hand-pushed ladder escapes a shorter extension ladder of the same type and pushed by hand scattered throughout the city housed in substations in the principal squares and more important thoroughfares and intended for emergency use only until the regular apparatus arrives they have also a few aerial ladder trucks carrying a very long extension ladder which can be raised by means of an ingenious little engine using carbonic acid gas for its motive power to a height of eighty feet or more but aside from use as a kind of water tower at large fires these aerial ladders are rarely extended to their full extent for the houses are nearly all of a uniform height not over five or six floors and the ordinary extension ladder is sufficiently long to reach the upper parts of these buildings the fire alarm boxes or alarm points as they are known are found at convenient corners throughout london and consist of an iron post about as high as an ordinary hitching post with a little round metal box at the top containing a glass door you break the glass in this door pull the little handle or knob inside and thus send in a fire call to four or five of the nearest fire stations in all american cities when a fire alarm box is pulled the alarm is transmitted direct to a central bureau usually at fire headquarters and is then retransmitted either automatically or by hand to the engine houses but in london and in every other european city 
each fire station has its own alarm bureau in charge of an officer and several operators these stations receiving only the alarms from the boxes in the immediate neighborhood all the stations however are connected with each other and with a central bureau or headquarters by both telegraph and telephone london has something like four thousand fires annually and spends about one million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars every year to support her fire brigade it is estimated that the city of new york comprising the boroughs of manhattan bronx brooklyn queens and richmond and with about the same population as london proper has twelve thousand five hundred fires annually and spends something over seven million five hundred thousand dollars to support her fire department in paris the fire brigade comes under the jurisdiction of the department of war and it is part of the french army that attends to the fire fighting in this famous city two battalions of infantry known as the regiment des sapeurs pompiers look after this important work and although this brigade is recruited drilled and commanded by various regimental officers from a colonel down to a lieutenant and belongs to the war department it comes under the direct control of the prefect of police the chief of police who is the actual head of the paris fire brigade these stations or as they are well named cassins barracks are big structures filled with many firemen on an average about a hundred and forty men in every building and each station is equipped with numerous pieces of fire apparatus and all are provided with a large inner court or drill yard in which the men go through military evolutions twice a day and where the new men who are coming into the brigade continually are taught how to handle all the various appliances used in fire fighting here also the men are put through a series of calisthenic exercises two or three times a week which if introduced into the american fire department would drive every man out of the service so vigorous are these stunts in acrobatic fashion the paris firemen are compelled to climb ropes jump hurdles balance themselves in mid-air on frail wooden supports perform on horizontal bars execute a kind of setting up drill en masse and last but not least climb up one of the walls of the courtyard holding on by their fingertips and the edges of their boots to little crevices in the walls and falling if they should slip into a pile of sand at the bottom in addition to all this they have the regulation hose ladder and life-saving drills of all other fire departments the paris fire stations are thoroughly up to date in equipment for we find them fitted with sliding poles swinging harnesses horses kept in box stalls within a pole's length of the harness automatic door openers and virtually every quick hitching device for which american fire departments are noted and in addition to steam fire engines aerial ladder trucks and hose wagons the latter very much of the same type as those used in this country there are a great many automobile fire engines in service and quite a few of the cassins or stations are equipped entirely with motor-driven apparatus there are also several electric fire engines in use practical-looking affairs carrying a large square tank containing four hundred gallons of water which is given the necessary pressure to reach the top of any of the buildings by means of an ingenious set of electric pumps placed at the back of the tank as it only requires a few men to handle this engine and the mere throwing over of a lever to get it under way it is used at many small fires and is sometimes the first and only piece of apparatus to leave a station in answer to an alarm for there is no regular assignment of engines and ladder trucks sent to the alarm boxes in paris as is the case in our cities and the operation of their fire alarm system differs from that of any other city in the world the fire station boxes are large ornate looking affairs placed on the corners of the principal boulevards and streets and in the public squares and directions on the outside of these boxes 
inform you that in addition to breaking the glass door which automatically transmits the number of the box to the nearest fire station you must also use the telephone inside and give a description of the fire its character size and location street number if possible and it is necessary to go through all this proceeding before the sending of an alarm is considered complete this alarm is received in the alarm or watch room of the nearest fire station there an operator picks up a telephone receiver and listens for your description of the fire and he decides according to the message received the number of pieces and character of the apparatus which is to answer the alarm for example if it is only a small fire a window curtain or a chimney he simply orders out one piece of apparatus an electric engine such as was described above or perhaps a fourron a sort of hose wagon carrying a squad of men short ladders hose and tools and appliances of all kinds if on the other hand the call comes from a factory or a tenement district where rescue work may be expected he then sends two wagon loads of men and the grande echelle aerial ladder truck and if the fire appears dangerous from the telephone description another ladder truck and a steam fire engine or a motor engine but the engines are rarely used in paris as the water pressure throughout the city is very fine sufficient to reach the top of the average building and the steamers are only sent out as a precaution and are seldom put to work the fire hydrants in paris as in every other city in europe are of the flush or sunken character instead of the post hydrants used in our cities and are found in depressed basins in the sidewalk near the curb protected with iron covers and the location of these hydrants is carefully indicated by metal signs on the walls of the buildings nearby which not only point out the exact position of each hydrant but tell the amount of water pressure to be found at that outlet a feature that our firemen would welcome all gas or electricity entering any building in paris comes partially under the control of the fire brigade and the firemen carry keys on every piece of apparatus which enables them to open a small metal plate always found at a certain spot in the sidewalks and thus cut off either the gas or electric service from the building immediately on their arrival at a fire but in addition to this very sensible supervision of the gas and electric service by the fire brigade the paris firemen have the added protection in their work of a very effective type of smoke helmet a device which is also used largely by the fire brigades of berlin dresden vienna milan and several other cities in europe this is a metal helmet fastening securely around the neck of the fireman wearing it and connected by means of an endless hose pipe with a portable air pump kept out in the street and in charge of a fellow fireman who controls the amount of fresh air reaching the headpiece it is claimed that protected with this device a fireman can enter a heavily smoke charged building and work for quite a while in comparative comfort we carry a smoke helmet on nearly all the fire apparatus in this country somewhat similar to the european appliance but without the independent air pump attachment it is rarely used however as our firemen claim that it is unreliable and hampers rather than aids them in their work but among the foreign firemen the smoke helmet is considered a valuable protection and is used frequently among other interesting appliances which the paris firemen have found of great assistance to them in their work there may be mentioned a portable electric searchlight carried like an ordinary hand lantern fitted with a powerful storage battery and producing a very intense and of course a thoroughly safe light it is used largely for night work or in dark smoky cellars also a large hand-carried electric fan which can be operated by hydraulic power as well as electricity using the pressure from the street hydrants for this purpose and this fan has been found useful for clearing rooms or hallways of heavy smoke or poisonous vapors 
paris with a population of two million seven hundred and fifty thousand souls has about eighteen hundred fires every year and spends annually five hundred and seventy five thousand dollars to support her fire brigade an organization of some eighteen hundred men which can be turned into the field as two battalions of infantry at short notice therefore this expenditure might be said to provide two kinds of protection military as well as civic but splendid building laws and equally excellent laws covering the use and storage of explosives and inflammable materials of all kinds have made the work of her firemen a comparatively easy one and the large fire is of such rare occurrence in this famous city that the french pompier using methods which appear very amusing to american visitors is enabled to make a most satisfactory yearly showing to his minister of war in berlin and in virtually every other german city the fire brigade is managed upon almost the same general plan as the brigades found in london and paris and the apparatus in nearly every instance of german manufacture is very similar to that used by the english and french firemen the men are all husky fellows well drilled and military in appearance and the majority are ex-soldiers as preference is given to men who have seen army service in recruiting new members for the brigade the fire stations are usually very large sometimes occupying as much space as would be covered by an entire block in an american city and nearly all of the stations are built in rectangular form with a spacious inner court or drill yard in the middle on one side of this yard will be found the engines ladder trucks etc housed in individual compartments or barns and on the other the stables for the horses while the upper part of the building on both sides is occupied as dormitories or lounging rooms for the men and quarters for the officers every station has its own fire alarm bureau or watch room looked after by an officer and two or three operators the turnout in answer to an alarm in a german fire station is very similar to an artillery drill and is performed in the same stiff almost automatic manner for the brigades are conducted on strict military lines the men in these stations are divided into little squads each commanded by a petty officer or oberfeuerwehrmann as he is called and each squad placed in charge of a separate piece of apparatus when an alarm strikes in the watch-room a bell is started ringing in the quarters of the men which sends them clattering down the long flight of stairs in their heavy leather boots while they hastily adjust coats belts and helmets reaching the yard each squad breaks up into two detachments two men the driver and his aide running to the stable for the horses the rest for their respective pieces of apparatus the doors of the apparatus barns are thrown open and the engines ladder trucks and wagons are found standing there with poles detached the latter lying on the floor directly under each machine at a command given by the petty officer the pole is lifted up shoved back in its socket and the kingpin dropped into place the men then jump back to the wheels at each side and at another command the apparatus is pushed out into the yard by this time the horses fully harnessed have been brought over from the stables by the other two men and are backed into position beside the pole the traces and pole straps are locked and at another command from the petty officer the driver and the rest of the men jump into their places on top of the apparatus and salute the brandmeister or commanding officer of the station this official leisurely getting into a six-seated wagon with his associate officers then gives the order to go and headed by the wagon containing the chief and his aides the procession dashes out through the arched driveway into the main thoroughfare thus completing an exhibition which when witnessed by americans usually provokes a laugh and when i add that upon the receipt of an alarm in the watch-room the location of the box is written down on a large yellow paper blank bearing the word foyer at its top that this blank is folded carefully and sent down to the apparatus floor by means of a small hand lift or elevator 
that it is taken therefrom by the commanding officer and read deliberately before he steps into his feuerwagen it will be seen that the german believes in attending to everything even a call as urgent as an alarm of fire in a thoroughly official and dignified manner but in berlin much of this military detail and pomp has been done away with and aided by swinging harness and many other quick hitching devices the firemen make a more rapid exit in answer to a call and once in the streets they cover the ground at great speed for the engines are light and the horses splendid and every one even the kaiser himself gives a clear field to the feuerwehr it cost the berliners with not quite the population of paris four hundred and eighty five thousand dollars a year to maintain their excellent fire brigade excellent because the fire loss in this royal city is hardly more than a fifth of that in new york but much of this remarkably low loss in the german capital is due to the careful work of the brigade in preventing any damage to property other than that caused by the actual extinguishment of the fire as an example of the conscientious way in which the berlin firemen attend to their labors it may be explained that at fires in the residential district where it is found possible to confine the fire to some one room tarpaulins or waterproof covers are spread over the stairs and through the halls before the hose is brought into the house and no windows are broken unless absolutely necessary when our buildings are all as excellent as theirs and our citizens are all working as harmoniously together to prevent fire we may find it safe to adopt some of the deliberate and careful methods of the german firemen End of chapter 12